pastors. They're in charge of the church, aren't they? What's all this talk about shepherds? Are we just dumb sheep? Why should that matter to me? We'll be exploring these questions and more on today's episode of Word Search with me, Christopher Dryden, where we're looking at episode 15, God's Bodybuilders Tending to His Sheep. Word Search is a place to search God's word and where God's word searches us. Here we encourage godly character development that stimulates seeking God's kingdom first and his righteousness on the belief that that should inform and transform our prayer and our practice. For here at Word Search, it, we're here to find treasure in God's word so that we can be hearers and doers of his word for his namesake. On this edition of Word Search, we'll be covering our journey so far in our series on God's fit body plan. We'll have our reading of Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 to 16, before we explore Jesus, the shepherd, and then look at how the shepherd connects with his shepherd and then to other shepherds, before concluding what it is to tend to his sheep. And then we'll see how that works together in God's fit body plan before we review the hints as to what we consider where his plan is concerned. And then at the end of our time together, we'll be looking at certain key prayer points that we can look to inform and transform our lives in the light of what we see in his word. So previously on Word Search, we've been looking at our series of God's fit body plan and that's all based on the premise that every believer is a member of the body of Christ and that means every believer belongs in Christian fellowship they are a crucial part of God's plan as to how he wants his body to function and each part functions for the body to be well so on that basis what we explored initially was Ephesians Paul's majestic letter to the church in Ephesus and what that had to say and then we focused particularly on Ephesians chapter 4 before going into Ephesians chapter 4 verses 11 to 16. In there what we discovered in Ephesians as a whole was how Jesus is the foundation and not just the foundation but he is the head and so the body of Christ that Jesus is building is all to be built to the fullness, to the maturity, that is the standard of who Jesus is himself. From there, we discovered how Jesus had given gifts to his body, gifts such as initially and primarily the apostle, and not just the apostle, but how the apostle informs the body of Christ, both in establishing the foundation of what the church is, and then allowing the church to know that it is there on a mission for God. From the apostle, we also so, saw how the prophet is also crucially a, a part of God's call for his body to be built. How the prophet is there as God's spokesperson and how that informs the church as to how they stay in line with who God is and then should inform others on the outside as to the standards of God. Last week, we were considering the role of the evangelist and considering carefully how the evangelist is there to help us to know the good news, be passionate about sharing the good news, and then see that inform the body of Christ to be captured with that desire to share the good news with others on the outside. Uh, that's all with us, with the plan that we're going to go forward in exploring the shepherd, the role of the shepherd today, as well as hopefully in our next episode, considering the role of the teacher all of that is in place because as a part of the body it's good to know how you fit and how we fit together to function as God wants us to so on that premise we're focusing on the shepherd today and to help us with that we will start off by having a reminder of our key scripture Ephesians chapter 4 verses 11 to 16 and that says as follows and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers 
to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Father, I love you. I adore you. I am just so grateful at this time that you should give us your word so that we can explore it, so that we can search it, and we can see how we are to be changed and how we are to be shaped to become more like your son. As we consider how your son is the good shepherd, and as we consider how your son gave the shepherd to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, we pray at this time that our hearts will be opened and our minds will be clear to see what you want us to see and to respond how you want us to respond in the light of your word. Help us now, O oh God, as we look to you and give you thanks in Jesus' name. So, in the light of this scripture, how we know that God has given us the shepherd, let's consider, first of all, how Jesus is the good shepherd. Let's have a look at John chapter 10, verses 7 to 18. And uh, that says as follows. John chapter 10, verse 7 to 18 says this. So Jesus again said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me, just as the father knows me and I know the father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my father. So let's consider carefully how this particular passage and this outline by Jesus helps us to understand who he is as the shepherd and see how that might inform what it is to be a shepherd to the sheep. It's first of all worth reminding ourselves that the whole concept of a shepherd is prominent throughout scripture. Whether it's with Abel or with Jacob or with Moses or with David or what God has to say through the prophets about how he's called his leaders to be shepherds. So many examples in scripture about the shepherd and the role of the shepherd and the sheep. At this stage, though, it's worth reminding ourselves that you can take analogies too far. 
Jesus does not mean to take this analogy too far to suggest that human beings are just dumb sheep. They are not just dumb sheep, but this picture is worth taking into consideration in terms of how God wants us to recognize how he is shepherding us, how he's leading us, and as we'll see in terms of the role of the shepherd, just how crucial it is that we see ourselves all as those who are being led by him along paths of righteousness for his namesake, as David himself would recognize as he expressed how the Lord was his shepherd. So in the light of that, it's also worth us considering how fitting it is that Jesus himself here fulfills the role of the shepherd to the peak. And indeed, it's fascinating to see that Jesus doesn't just recognize himself as a shepherd, but establishes himself as the good shepherd. So all other shepherds to that extent are really just under shepherds, underlings who are pointing to this good shepherd. So what makes him such a good shepherd is worth exploring. And there are four points that I think are worth looking at in terms of what makes Jesus a good shepherd. The first that we see is that Jesus is a good shepherd because he relates. He actually connects and relates to his sheep. He knows his sheep. His sheep know him. That is to say that Jesus effectively has developed a reciprocal relationship with his sheep so that they know him and he knows them. The other way that Jesus expresses himself as a good shepherd is how he guides. So the way that the knowing takes place is how he calls them. He calls them by name. He knows who they are. And not only does he call them, but he leads them. And he's in the business to look to gather them. So even as he looks at the sheep, as he's talking to his specific audience in terms of the Jews, and then he's expressing to them that there are other sheep that I've got to gather. Jesus has this kind of ongoing guiding relationship to bring the sheep together so that they can be one sheep under the one shepherd, the one flock under the one shepherd, as you will. So he relates and he guides. And not only that, but he nurtures as well. So Jesus, as the good shepherd, tends to his sheep. And I love what he says before he even expresses himself as the good shepherd, because he expresses that he is here so that they, meaning his sheep, may have life and may have it abundantly. That is the key way in which he wants to nurture his sheep. He wants them to enjoy the fullness of life that they can find in him. So he tends, he looks after, he nurtures his sheep. So he relates, he guides, he nurtures, and he also protects. So this shepherd is known by the fact that he's willing to protect his sheep. It's really great that Jesus compares the shepherd to a hired hand, a hireling in other versions, and how that hireling is really looking out for himself so that when he sees danger, he runs from danger. But where Jesus sees danger, he runs to it to protect his sheep. Such is his ability and his desire to protect his sheep that he, laid down, he lays down his life for his sheep. He doesn't just lay his life down for his sheep, as we see in the scripture, but he lays down and then he comes back up again to ensure that the sheep are never devoured by wolves or scattered by wolves. So he's, he's really a protective shepherd. And indeed, when we think about uh, the great psalm that David wrote about how the Lord is his shepherd, we know that the Lord was his shepherd especially that when they walk through the valley of the shadow of death, God's way of um, comforting them was to ensure both that they stayed in line with the way that he was leading by the rod and the staff, and also how the rod and the staff would be used to keep away those forces that would look to devour or divide. And so God is careful through his son, the good shepherd, to ensure that his sheep are protected from division and being devoured. Good. Uh, so we've got these elements of how Jesus is the good shepherd. He relates, he guides, he nurtures, he protects. 
And it's not just in John that we see Jesus behaving like this. There are other scriptures in the Gospels that it's worth your while exploring to see how Jesus is a shepherd that tends after his own. In fact, even in this book of John, we're encouraged to look at how John, how Jesus is a shepherd, even in John chapter 4. Have a read through John chapter 4 and notice where Jesus cares for, relates, guides, nurtures people, especially how he wants to invite others. Uh, who are not a part of that flock at the moment, to become a part of the flock. But don't let me spoil that for you. You have a look at John chapter 4 for yourself and see how Jesus is the shepherd there. And then you'll also see throughout Matthew and Mark and Luke as well, how Jesus calls those to be his own, leads those who are his own, protects those who are his own, nurtures those who are his own, and lays down his life for his own and then picks his life up again to continue to protect his own so jesus establishes a high standard of what it is to be a shepherd and the reassuring thing is that all of those who are gifted to be shepherds don't have as high a responsibility as he has because he's done it all to the peak However, let's explore then carefully how this shepherd relates to a upcoming shepherd by what the word of God has to say in John chapter 21, verses 15 to 19. And that says as follows. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, uh, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, uh, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, Son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Uh, truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you're old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. Now, what's so fascinating about this scripture is as follows. First of all, it's a fascinating, precious scene of the restoration of Peter to service. So Peter had denied Jesus three times, but now here's Jesus restoring Peter to service. And not any service, but specifically to pastoral service. And this gives us insight into how the shepherd, the good shepherd, instructs his shepherds, his under shepherds, if you will. And what I find fascinating in this scripture is that Jesus's message to Peter is to feed the lambs, tend the sheep, then develop, as in to feed the sheep. So there's something about the gradual, there's something about the nurturing, there's something about the tending. And I want you to know how all of that, as far as Peter is concerned, is based on the relationship of love. So good shepherds follow the good shepherd because they love the good shepherd. Indeed, Jesus's first challenge to Peter is, do you love me more than these? So if our first love, if our primary love, if the number one love, is Jesus. That's a very good sign of uh, being in the place to follow what the Good Shepherd is to share. So everything in that sense is based on the Shepherd. And the relationship that we have, the love relationship that we have with the Shepherd. 
Therefore, it's crucial for us to focus on the one who has gifted and called those to be shepherds. So those who are called to be shepherds should be recognized both by Jesus and by the sheep. There should be a recognition that clearly this person has been gifted by the Lord Jesus Christ to be a shepherd because their focus is on the good shepherd themselves. And that's why it's key what we see here in terms of what Jesus does with Peter. And it's fascinating also to see how the good shepherd expects his shepherds to be sheep who follow. So after all that uh, Jesus outlines to Peter in terms of his destiny, what, how he's destined to glorify God, Peter's, Peter is challenged by Jesus to follow the shepherd. So a shepherd is a good shepherd because they follow the good shepherd. Those elements are crucial in terms of what we see as an example, especially this particular example of how Jesus restores and reinstates Peter for service. It's based on the relationship and it's based on the example that the shepherds can provide to others, to their desire to feed, their desire to tend to, their, their desire to develop and to nurture, all of that. That's right there in what Jesus is doing in reinstating and installing Peter into the role that he's called to be. And then it's even more fascinating to see how Peter then, based on this inspiration, will go on to inspire other shepherds as well, as we see here in 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 to 5. And here, in the last words that Peter has to share with the brethren, he has these specific words to say to the elders. He says as follows, So I exhort the elders among you, as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker, in the glory that is going to be revealed, shepherd the flock of God that's among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Uh, likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility towards one another, for God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So here is a man who's known what it's been like to follow the good shepherd. He knows what it's like to be discipled. He knows what it's like to be corrected, to be rebuked, to be uh, nurtured under this good shepherd. And then he's been able to exercise that in his time as a fellow elder. Notice as well that Peter isn't pulling rank among the elders to suggest that he's the super elder. He's the archbishop. Mm -mm -mm -mm. As far as he is concerned, he is one among many. He's, he's, he's a co-elder with them. He's not pulling rank among them as he talks. Also notice with me that here is Peter encouraging others in their position. That also is a good nudge to suggest that shepherds are very good at identifying and encouraging other shepherds. They don't see themselves as being necessarily better than or higher than or greater than, but they're in the business to encourage others. And that's going to be useful as we see more shepherds developing. While we're there, we can also see how Peter instructs these shepherds in how they are to operate, the motive from which they operate and the purpose in which they operate. So the purpose is to oversee the development of the flock and the way that they do it is eagerly and willingly. Now, why would they do that eagerly and willingly? They wouldn't necessarily do that eagerly and willingly primarily for the sheep, They'll do it eagerly and willingly, primarily for the good shepherd. So even as Peter learnt by focusing on the good shepherd, so we'll notice that all of those appointed to be shepherds, gifted to the body to be shepherds, will do that in following the example of the good shepherd. They will do it willingly. They will do it eagerly. Now, that's not to suggest there isn't a responsibility on the part of the sheep. Clearly there is. 
That's why Peter will go on to suggest that it's important that all of those who recognize the elders should be subject to those elders. But again, notice as well that those shepherds are in that position because they do not domineer. They don't lord it over others. So Peter, again, has learned well from Jesus in terms of when Jesus instructed the disciples that when it came to structures, they shouldn't operate as they see the world operates with that hierarchical model that sees people lording it over others because they're in a higher position. But Jesus would go on to suggest that you know that you're great in the kingdom because you appear to be the least and you look to serve. So that really flips on its head all of those kind of hierarchical models that gives you the impression that you should work your way to the top and working your way to the top is to be the shepherd, to be the pastor, pastor this or pastor that or pastor the other. And when you're in that position, oh, I'm a big man now and nobody can challenge me because I'm in charge. That is not the heart or the expression of the shepherd because the key way that the shepherds do their shepherding is their example. So it's not primarily by instruction or direction it's by how they live how do they show themselves to be ones who care for others to nurture others to tend to others how are they in that sense how do they live how do they establish those relationships how do they guide and nurture how are they transparent before those that they're called to lead because it's very easy to in a very commons lead from a pulpit where all that people see is what you can do from that position but you can show your example by the life that you present to others in that real way that Jesus was able to show to Peter. And Peter then is able to encourage other elders to show that by their example. And then when Peter says at the end, clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility towards one another, where do you reckon that should start? Who is the first person to express humility to others? I'll leave it to you to guess where the, that should start, if that's a characteristic of the shepherd. Far be it from me uh, to kind of drop any hints as to the fact that it's really the shepherd to do that, because I'm not that kind of person to kind of give the game away uh, to let you know that it really should be the shepherds who are the first people to show humility. I'll leave it to you to stay in that place of mystery where that's concerned. So what we've covered so far is how Jesus is the good shepherd and how he promotes that in the examples of relating to his sheep, guiding his sheep, nurturing his sheep, and then protecting his sheep. We've seen how Jesus was able to bring Peter in on the action when he reinstated him. And now we're seeing how Peter then is showing that example and instructing and encouraging others who are likewise called to be pastors, shepherds of the flock of the Lord Jesus Christ. Noting carefully, and it's worth saying this, the shepherds are looking after Jesus's flock. Uh, so there is that sense in terms of certain pastors get very, very proprietorial over their people as though it's their people. And that's understandable, but really and truly, they are given the stewardship over the flock of Jesus. Uh, and what they do is to be an example to the flock that points them to the good shepherd. So in the light of all that we've explored today, what kind of conclusions can we reach? And allow me to suggest here are a few of the key conclusions that we can reach. One is that Jesus is the good shepherd. I don't want us to take that for granted at all. We were saved by Jesus. We are saved to follow Jesus. And the desire and the aim is to be like, surprise, surprise, Jesus. So when it comes to the caring, nurturing, nurturing, tending after others, we're doing that because Jesus does that. And we're doing that because he gives us his spirit so that we can be like that. And to help us in that path, Jesus has gifted the body with those who reflect this element of who he is as the shepherd. So he's given us shepherds to be that example to us, to reflect him as the shepherd so that we can know what it is to be more and more like him. So those shepherds primarily reflect who Jesus is as a good shepherd in their example. So it's not primarily by their direction first, it's about how they live 
how they serve, how they share, how they care, how they tend, how they nurture, how they protect, all of those things are there. And indeed, the beauty about the gift that Jesus gives to the body is it's who they are. They don't need a title to do that. Uh, it's, it's who they are. They naturally pastor. Just as beforehand, when we were looking at the evangelists and the prophets and the apostles, they didn't need a title because they, it's a gifting and a calling. And they're just acting out on their calling. And it'll be great if we recognize that. But even as we're slow to recognize that, that doesn't stop the individual from exercising what they've clearly been gifted to exercise. And in this case, it's where we can identify those who clearly cares for others, clearly wants to see others nurtured to become more like Christ, and clearly wants to protect the saints together as they develop those relationships together to be more and more like Jesus. It's also worth reminding ourselves, first of all, that Jesus has gifted us with shepherds, uh, plural. Hmm, interesting. And also that the shepherds, plural, are a part of, that they are among those who are gifted to build and equip the body of Christ. So it's interesting when you see models of church that wants to stress on the pastors, but doesn't necessarily recognize the crucial role that the apostles and the prophets and the evangelists, as well as the teachers, have in the building and the equipping of the church. Shepherds are a part of the gifts that Jesus has given for the building and equipping of his body. Shepherds, plural, are a part of that whole team mentality as to how the body of Christ reflects who Jesus really is. And then it's crucial again to remind ourselves that shepherds operate and function in how they care for, protect, nurture, and develop the flock of the Lord Jesus Christ. So when you see those attributes uh, acting on and being, and you're impacted by that, then you know that clearly this person has been gifted to be a shepherd. But it's not just that, but we must recognize that the church needs the shepherds to stir us all up to be people who care and nurture like the Lord Jesus Christ. So in the same way that we see how they're there to build and equip, they are there to build and equip us, equip us for the works of service. That service is seen by the desire to care and nurture others and learn what it is to be more and more like Jesus. So even as I said at the start of our conclusions, how Jesus is the good shepherd, my challenge to you at this time is, can we see Jesus, the shepherd? Do we have a vision of him protecting, nurturing, caring for, developing us? Do we have that picture in our minds? So I want us to see how that's applied to God's fit body plan, how his body is built. And I want us to re remind ourselves about how everything is built on the example that we have in terms of the Lord Jesus Christ and how he has deliberately seen it fit to build the body of Christ based on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. The apostles there to lay that foundation of being the sent ones on a mission to establish the kingdom of God through the sharing of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the nurturing of those who hear that to develop that initial group. And so there's a role for the apostle both in sharing beyond in terms of new territory, as well as equipping those within. And then there's the prophetic role that is crucial to hear what God has to say to the body at that time to align people to his will, to his word, and to his way, and how that can help the body of Christ to also exercise its prophetic responsibility to the world. Then there's also the key role of the evangelist, reminding ourselves that we are here as messengers delivering the good news of the kingdom of God and the good news of who Jesus is, and how that is our calling and responsibility and how we are supposed to be stirred up by the evangelists among ourselves to be building on that. And then today, hopefully what we've seen is how likewise we reflect who Jesus is through him being a shepherd that cares, nurtures, tends to, and protects those that are his own as he relates to them in a way that brings him honor and glory. So those are the key ways that we are seeing how God's fit body plan works. In our next episode, as I'm sure you can and detect we'll be looking at the role of the teacher 
uh, but I'll let that speak for itself. All of these roles, all of these gifts are given to the body of Christ so that we can reach the maturity, which is Jesus himself. So there's Jesus, the foundation, building his body to reach maturity. That is Jesus himself. There were some key hints that we're supposed to review at this particular juncture. So first of all, I hope that we can see in today's lesson that a key gift given to help the body of Christ to develop is the role of the shepherd. I hope that we can also see that a key work of the ministry is for us to be about caring and nurturing after each other. So when we talk about love, it's not just expecting the love to be seen by the pastor as though it's all on him or her. Uh, it's all on them to be able to do it, but they're, they're there to stir us up to likewise be those who care and nurture after others as the work of ministry. We can also see that members of the body of Christ that are there to express those elements of care and nurturing and supporting and developing however they're called to develop. And it helps the body to function because we're not just there to give people good news. We express the good news of the rule of God by how we love each other. By this, they will know that we follow Jesus by the love that we have one for another. That's why it matters that the body of Christ recognizes the key role of this shepherd and how it's supposed to equip us. So that as a part of the body, it's good to know how you fit and how we fit together to function as God wants us to. In the light of these things, here are some key prayer points I want us to consider. First of all, as ever, I want us to praise God for Jesus, our good shepherd. Whenever you think about Psalm 23 again, it should lead you to seeing Jesus as our good shepherd who fulfills all of those elements. And it's something that we should be constantly having the vision of, not just to see it to be reassured by having Jesus as our good shepherd, but also following him in our way. So it's important for us to praise God for Jesus, our good shepherd, and then to thank God that Jesus has seen, his, seen it fit to give us pastors. Thank God for all the pastors that you can see, both those that are evident and clear in their positions and the budding pastors that are growing among us, exercising their care, their nurture, their protective natures. Let's ask God for the humility to follow the example of those gifted pastors. Um, it's not just for them to do their job, it's for us to take our responsibility seriously in humbling ourselves underneath them, looking to follow their example of care for the glory of God. And then let's seek God for opportunities to care and tend to others. We're supposed to be following the example that they're setting. So it's not just about being in the seat of the care, the nurture and the protection. It's about us putting it into action ourselves for the glory of God in serving others, as well as serving those beyond the church with that care and that nurture that God gives us. And as we praise God, as we thank God, as we ask God, and as we seek God, let's celebrate God that his eternal purposes are fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ, the good shepherd. We know when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And that's a glorious promise that we have that's worth celebrating, that all of the eternal purposes of God are fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ. So as we exercise those prayer points and as we pray in the light of these points we can celebrate the reality again that kingdom people apply kingdom practices in kingdom pursuits for kingdom purposes next time on word search with me christopher dryden we will be going on to episode number 16 where we will be considering god's body builders that will teach you uh, we'll be considering the role of the teacher please join us for that to explore carefully the crucial role that the teacher has in building the body of christ in the meantime please remember to like this particular episode of word search yeah click that thumb sign to say that you like it and share it with those that you care for i mean after all we just learned about what it is to be a good shepherd what it is to follow in the way of the shepherd if you care about somebody share this with them so that it will stir them likewise uh, to want to be those that god has called them to be in caring for them 
Uh, subscribe to the channel. Your subscriptions mean so much to us. Uh, and remember to turn that notification bell on so that you can be updated on future episodes of Word Search uh, with me, Christopher Dryden. So remember to like, remember to share, remember to subscribe and support the channel uh, however you wish to do so. You can always do that by getting in contact with us on the email address given in the description below. We look forward to receiving that support because we do recognize that we're not independent and we do connect ourselves with those who recognize the service that we give. And if you want to support us, we'll be happy to receive that. One of the ways that we know that you can support us is to apply all that we're teaching in these series. We're not just here to hear, we're here to put it into action. So that's putting it into action in terms of seeking Jesus, the good shepherd, recognizing the shepherds that God has called and seeing how you likewise can be good for the Lord Jesus. So while you're doing that, thank you so much for your time in paying attention to this episode of Word Search with me, Christopher Dryden. Really appreciate your time in doing so. God richly bless you for doing that because here at Word Search, we're keen to find treasure in God's word so that we can be hearers and doers of that word for his glory. And so until next time on Word Search, God richly bless you and those that you care for as you grow to be more and more like Jesus. Shalom. <laughs>